Welcome everyone. Uh, it's a bug's life, as you might remember uh, the cartoon from the end of the 90s. Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, who am I? I'm Balaj, uh, and I use basically the middle name of all the three. Uh, don't get me wrong, sometimes you will see me uh, and be called Tatar, which is my last name, so it's like, yeah, we are Hungarians, weird people. Um, I'm working with Drupal since uh, 2007, and there are quite a lot of things that I do, uh, or trying to do as, as best, uh, such as being a CTO of Patent, which is an agency and recruitment company in Hungary, and also in Belgium, and, and also I work as a consultant for the European Commission in Brussels, Belgium again um, as a Drupal security correspondent and basically in about 45 minutes we are going to get uh, the new Drupal security release window open so like I will have other works again uh, or who knows I'm also a provisional member in the Drupal security team and such as other things uh, but let's talk about security um, how we try to tackle it in a decoupled world uh, so first of all it's very important to understand uh, when we talk about security, it's, it, it starts with being aware of what is security. There are many, many programs all over the world uh, that tries to educate people at work, in open source uh, software uh, communities, but like everywhere that we try to advocate as a security awareness program. How it starts, in, um, in a workplace, basically talking about educating the employees or, or contractors to be aware how measurements work. Such as, uh, if, if there is a problem in the network, people might not realize uh, their passwords are not stored securely or they are not forced regularly to change them. All these security awareness programs fall back to these first steps when we try to let all the people who work with us, especially with uh, less, less being aware of security, how they should tackle day-by-day -day issues. It's also important to mention these individuals might not be even technical people, but they should not you know, uh, put their quite strong password on a sticky note and put it on the monitor. <laughs> it is a classical issue that we face usually with non-technical people. Please let them know, even if you are not in security field, this is just way so unsecure. So where we start the whole story is making sure everyone is aware of security, not just when we are getting hacked, right? Um, there is one more aspect uh, in security awareness which is kind of a buzzword nowadays coming from DevOps side, but we are transferring it to DevSecOps. Anyone knows what is De DevSecOps or could give a, like a one-liner about it? How does it go nowadays? Have you heard about DevSecOps or the program of De DevSecOps? Great. If you haven't, that's fine. It's one of the newest uh, sort of become high sort of decoupled uh, approach that we are facing with. So DevOps is kind of like, you know, uh, development with operation. DevSecOps is injecting um, um, an iterative um, knowledge sharing to all the people and involving security. Um, all the responsibilities fall back to individuals when we talk about uh, company security policies. What I mean is, in your workplace, there might be a policy that says um, you have to regularly, again, I'm going back to the same example, you have to regularly update your password. Obviously, those passwords are sometimes, uh, are just like, uh, you know, a word that reminds you for something, one. Next month, you are changing it to two. Then, to three. Please do not do that. Those are, again, predictable. Also tell your colleagues, it's again not the best practice to just update the numbers, even though most of us do that, right? Those are just not best practices. What we can do, and what, what is seen in large organizations, usually those security awareness um, items come as a top-to-down approach. So usually there are like someone on the top 
let's say, like a, a chief security officer who says, like, consulting with others, of course, uh, these are our policies. But you, as such as a, a, a developer, or, um, I don't know, a marketing person, have to be able to file an issue or file a complaint saying, I don't agree because of this or that, uh, changing the passwords every second month should be more frequent. Or, I don't agree to use uh, open Wi-Fi ports because we need to increase our security. Um, also, like, big organizations have that kind of practice nowadays, uh, letting people know via uh, regular you know, newsletters, for instance, saying these are the vulnerabilities that happened uh, in systems that we are maintaining or that we are using. And because of these, uh, between 5 and, and 6 p.m., we are going to update your, uh, your systems, your desktops. In this period, please pay attention, whatever you do, save it regularly, and so on and so forth. Um, it's very important to, to get this information by your uh, CSO, for instance, or by your office uh, that, that tackles vulnerabilities. Because usually when there is a vulnerability, such as in, in Drupal field, um, not necessarily you are aware of your system, use it or not, because it might come uh, as a dependency, right? Especially if, if you are using um, a big bundle of um, you know, libraries. Those are just depending on something that depends on something else, and in the end you just don't know, for instance, in, in Drupal core there are like thousands of dependencies, right? Um, what we can do as individuals to implement these things is basically um, letting others know in our uh, surrounding how things work, using media, for instance. Just send an email, maybe unencrypted, maybe not, uh, about an article. Maybe you already have an office that takes care of it. Maybe they just don't monitor everything. Maybe in your workplace, Drupal is not the primary uh, solution that you use, or, or uh, in a digital agency, there are many uh, different technologies nowadays that they use. And for instance, they just don't monitor properly WordPress plugins, right? It's kind of hard even to monitor properly WordPress plugins because there is not even a single place where you can discover all of these. Um, yeah, let's go further. All the security issues that we find in custom or, or community-built uh, solutions, those are just bugs. And that's one of the biggest message that this session is about. Please do not put any blames on the people who write those issues. You are on your career, you do Drupal or you do whatever for a certain amount of time, right? If you introduce a vulnerability, it's basically the same when you make a bug in your code. The issue is with that, there might be different impacts. But please understand, we are just talking about bugs, which are usually malfunctioning in a programming level. So if there is a security issue in the code that you have written, then it is just a bug. There is no blaming game. If anyone tells you, just because you are a maintainer of a contrib module that gets a highly critical update, please first be proud. Collaborate, we are in Drupal, maybe. collaborate with the people who are letting you uh, do the fixes. Understand what is the issue first, then help them or do the fix together. It is always about learning never about blaming, right? The whole story why I'm choosing the bug's life is basically having four different stages that all the bugs have. Let's start with the eggs. So what we know about the eggs um, is basically the very beginning of all bugs, how they are, you know, becoming a bug, or whatever. 
Um, what we know is in the, in the first part of each IT project, there are always issues with planning. How the project manager sets up the team? What is the budget? A quick question. Um, what do you think? Where is the best to introduce security learning? Is it somewhere in the beginning of a project or iteratively during the project or after that, uh, such as you know, um, uh, retrospective to learn what we, what we did wrong? Uh, what it could be the best? Let's see some votes. Um, in the very beginning, even before the whole story starts, being aware of how uh, security should be written or how, in a secure fashion, code should be written. Anyone? Says like, okay, a few, okay. Iteratively during the project, learning new stuff. A little bit more, okay. Uh, just right after we delivered, we are fine and, and we finally have some time and budget, hopefully, uh, to learn what we did wrong and, and do some security review and stuff like that. Anyone? Okay, there is still one. Um, they say usually before the whole project starts. Because then, if you are getting into the project, or even a later stage, you increase the, the budget that has to be spent for that ex um, exponentially. So if you discover issues, your team is not aware of, I don't know, how SQL injection should be prevented in your code, but only later, the cost that the project <coughs> will require for that will be even higher, especially was, was very good uh, to say in, in a low number right after the project is delivered. Because then there comes the next project and the next project. And it's always iterative. There will be a yet another one. So before you start a whole project, try to let your uh, PM or, or um, um, you know people who are managing business to set up a certain amount of money or budget to teach the people that they are not aware. Um, there is a nice uh, method uh, developed by uh, Andrew van der Stock uh, who says. Um, the thinking evil uh, way of tackling issues is, is kind of a good approach. Let's say there are three big questions. Is the process surrounding this feature as safe as possible? In other words, uh, is this a flawed process? What it means is basically all the things that are around the process, around the functionality, are already as safe as possible. The second one says, if I were evil, how would I abuse this feature? If there is a functionality like, let's say, uh, changing password, okay? On, on that page, usually, IT projects require to set up twice the new password. Do we need to set the old password again? Or is it coming from a... I don't know, encoded uh, part or coming with, uh, with post requests and saying, okay, you are already authorized to visit this page. Think evil. Is it always good to ask the old password or you just want to save some time for your user? I would say it's crucial to ask the old password because then at least you again ask permission by your user to change your uh, to change his or her password. But the third one is basically about the default values. Is it like um, required to be on default? So if, if there is that feature such as changing the password, okay again, uh, is it required to be enabled by default? Or there might be some other way easier ways that might allow the user to change the password. If so, are there limits or options that could help reduce the risk from this feature? Changing the password itself doesn't seem so risky um, functionality, right? But what if that page can be visited and injected on that page some malicious code that changes all the users 
possibilities. You don't want to end up there. So always try to think how, and that's the message here, how the functionality can be abused. Uh, there are a few principles uh, from first and second and from third party, um, you know, parties, um, such as the least privileged user, I, I will just uh, pick a few, uh, such as the least privileged user is the best to be tackled. So imagine you are given uh, in Drupal a, a permission um, which allows um, filtered HD and HDMI. You don't really want to give, or not necessarily, want to give that um, permission to unauthenticated users, right? I'm not talking about full HDMI, but maybe limited, uh, or filtered, it's called. Um, but if you are giving it to administrators, that's just fine. But an administrator is a way higher uh, user role. So the less that uh, less secure um, user could do is the best. There are a few other things that I would highlight from third parties, such as you get on your website uh, some Node.js, um, you know, libraries. The best is to never trust other services. I know it sounds a little bit weird because we are still in a community, so we are trusting other services, but not blindly. That's the message here. So whenever you have uh, a Drupal module on your website, the reason why we uh, get it from Drupal.org because that place is a trusted source, right? So we don't necessarily want to end up uh, getting all different kinds of forks from GitHub or whatever um, platforms just to get yet another uh, Drupal contrib on our site because those ones are not covered by the Drupal security team. So whatever happens over there, the Drupal security team will never file any issues. They will not release in half an hour something that happens on uh, GitHub, right? Um, and also, it's, it's, it might sound weird, but please try to fix issues correctly. So imagine um, if, if there is a, an update today uh, hey, uh, with um, EasyGrad Grant, okay? I'm the maintainer of it, so that's why I'm, I'm using that. A um, few weeks ago, we got an update from EasyGrad Grant, which got quite soon exploited in the wild. So if by any chance we are gonna get another one today, you want to fix both, right? You don't want to fix only like patching the current one that we are gonna get today. I'm just assuming this is an example, this is not truth, just examples. Um, so you don't want to just use the today issue to be fixed on your services and forget the previous one. Not just because it, it might be less or more uh, risky, but still try to always fix it correctly. Let's go for the second phrase, which is a category. So when you when you already have the budget, you already can start doing the development, you are already on the phrase to do the sprints. Sometimes in the beginning it's a little bit harder, then the team gets into it, understanding each other, especially in a new project, especially in large organizations, and you are getting into the development phase. This is scale appeal. It's very important to let your stakeholders know what is the story about. Let's see. Uh, the basic principles and how they may be implemented in software, uh, in software production is vital to software security. What it means if there is a stakeholder who is like totally a non-IT guy or girl. We all know that, right? Like a marketing person. That person will never get into our field if we are more or less uh, from IT, right? I guess. Um, so they just not necessarily want to understand the things that we talk about. But here, security comes crossing all the fields. So if I cause an issue, it might cause millions of uh, dollars 
for another department because their data will be just uh, available for uh, non-authorized non actors. We don't want to end up there. That's why all the stakeholders should be aware of security. That's why, and we are falling back to the first topic, uh, we talk about security awareness. Um, the basic skills for uh, having a secure mindset is basically trying to protect from disclosures, such as what Drupal security team does. If there is an issue that is reported for them, they don't, uh, they don't disclose it until the window is open and until everything is properly set. Everything is correctly fixed, right? All the things that I'm trying to give you as messages are somehow falling back to security awareness because we have to be aware, aware of it. Um, also, it's, it's um, yeah, to the requester, all the rights and all the privileges just belong, belong to. What it means is uh, the requester who requests that certain functionality has to be at least privileged and has to be aware of what are the implications that uh, functionality might involve, right? Um, try to manage all the configurations, all the sessions, and all the errors, exceptions in a secure fashion again. So if there is an issue with the code, obviously we are doing uh, object-oriented, more or less, um, in, in PHP, and we just want to throw um, exceptions. But those exceptions are good if just generic ones, general ones, or we want to, you know, in a, in a um, format, so we, we only accept numbers and we just throw a very generic exception, or we might throw a more uh, specific one. Try to always do as specific as you can, because later on, also from logs, you will see where the software fails. There are three different types of um, levels of security. One uh, comes from application level. That's basically the top. Um, when we when we try to protect our applications, um, it's very important to, to think in a decoupled way. So there is a front end. There are classical front end issues such as cross site scripting, but there are classical back end issues such as remote code execution. But in the end, those can come from different angles. When you get any types of data, you allow in different form um, items on your website to accept those data. When you transfer those data to your backend, on that moment you have to validate, even sanitize. Even though we say in Drupal, when you show the value that you have from database or from such as backend, uh, you have to always sanitize it against cross-site scripting. But generally saying, when you accept the data to reach your application and later on to your uh, infrastructure or even to your uh, servers, you always have to know what you accept, what you want to accept. Um, all the third parties should be hopefully on the latest version. But you can expect uh, maintenance updates or bug fixes. I'm not saying at all to not update those. Please do so. Because next time there will be yet another security update on that certain library or plugin or whatever. And then you might end up in a state where you just can't easily update and you have to patch and figure out how you are getting there again to, uh, to keep your website or, or application safe. Um, we were talking about the password policies and all sorts of encryption and hashing algorithms fall into uh, application security. If we go one further, then we also have to, not necessarily we if we are on, on development teams, but our devops, for instance, have to secure um, the infrastructure. 
nowadays we, we talk mainly about HTTPS, but there are way more protocols that we either should enforce on our application level to be able to reach the, the infrastructure, um, or just saying we don't want to allow direct SSH connections. Uh, we don't want to end up um, publicly disclosing information about our web server, right? No one wants to show nowadays we are still running on PHP 5.3, right? There might be some reasons why you are forced to use those old versions of a, um, of a library or of an um, infrastructure level. But please always try to hide them. Because whatever should you show to the internet, it is there. Someone will find it. And if it's like uh, 5.6.2 PHP, there are way so many newer updates on 5.6 and lots of them are security updates. So try to keep up all the latest versions to protect your infrastructure. Um, there are a few things that I would highlight in web, web security practices, such as um, setting secure uh, flags in cookies. So when, when we talk about application and also about uh, infrastructure, we sometimes just forget uh, the end user, and basically we have to serve them, right? Uh, when we when we use cookies, and nowadays most of the applications just use because they have to use cookies for personalization or for other reasons. Um, try to also set them in a secure way, not just throwing their cookie and something will be stored there, even encrypted. Uh, and then those cookies can be intercepted, even stolen. Try to always use secure connections. At least those uh, ensure you are getting those cookies in the way how it should be. Um, but also we can talk about secure response headers. For instance, uh, last year when we got um, a highly critical Drupal core update, uh, yeah, highly critical. Um, it was allowing different headers to be used for exploitation, but not all. Later on, it, it, it got the, um, discovered even the get, part, uh, get headers are vulnerable. So we got follow ups. Uh, what I'm here trying to achieve is understanding the way or showing you how it could be always uh, on the on the secure fashion implement something that you might not even think about using HTTPS uh, is just something that you as an application developer just don't really want to take care of but what if your DevOps or your uh, system is just not aware of why it should be HTTPS I hope you will bring this message to those colleagues and uh, Drupal TV will be used to show this session, or at least the slides will be there somewhere on the internet uh, to raise this uh, awareness. Let's go closer to the first release, or talk about the first releases of the application, which is represented by, sorry, I'm not native as you heard, uh, Chrysalis, kind of, um, which is mainly about when we reach the, the, the release, the first releases, what can we do? What can we, for instance, request? There are different types of services uh, that can be requested to increase the security level on an application or like all on an IT project. The first is a vulnerability assessment. Assessment as is means we are trying to figure out where it can fail. There are different conditions coming from uh, the environment, so usually an assessment happens on a not production but close enough to be called production environment and we try to uh, see that environment as a pre-production. Um, the whole application and the infrastructure has to be scanned during an assessment. That's why usually it takes a while to do so. Most of the people just expect 
okay, there is a vulnerability assess whatever, uh, and it's gonna be done in two days. Yeah, good luck. I mean, if you are see, uh, if you see uh, an offer uh, for a vulnerability assessment, uh, which is going to be delivered after uh, starting the test in 24 hours, um, I wish you all the best to see a good result. Because usually it takes, especially setting up uh, the scanners, uh, takes a while. What I would suggest as a tool, uh, which you also can use, uh, and it's an open source one, uh, it's called OWASP ZAP. It's basically scanning your website and it tries to exploit from different angles like injecting to all the form items, different weird malicious codes, uh, trying to achieve uh, something that you might do by your hand, but whatever happens by your hand can be done by your script. Uh, so that's basically the, the uh, basis. Also, it's important, but usually happens in bigger organizations, to have an asset, uh, asset manager or management tool. That basically, imagine you are working for a digital agency and you have like a uh, four digit number of applications. How you are making sure all of them are running on a secure fashion? So, usually, there are tools that scan these uh, networks or set of applications and tell you, okay, here are some uh, vulnerabilities that are still not resolved or remediated. Um, for instance, in GitHub, there are there is a tool, I guess not for the free account, I'm not sure, uh, because they just recently uh, changed a lot there, um, which are about marking different dependencies to be insecure, uh, only for the owners, so not like shouting out, but um, still raising some awareness, those should be updated. Sometimes it's not so easy to, to update them, because those are like a weird, deep uh, graph somewhere at the bottom, and if you want to update them, you have to update this level at that level, and the end, you have to migrate everything from Drupal 7 to, to Drupal 8, uh, which is just a cool practice, right? Um, if we go one step further, uh, those are the so-called security assessments. So everything that, that you heard about the vulnerability assessment is included here, plus one more uh, important stuff, which is verifying the issues. So sometimes those tools, such as BERP or OASP uh, or all kinds of scanners, uh, just give you way so many uh, false positive issues. So like, I, I saw a, a report way back in time uh, that was saying in, in uh, TPL files, Drupal 7 time, uh, all the print uh, lines are just vulnerable. That was like, yeah, then we are facing with like, I don't know, 4,000 issues, right? So those were just blind reports. Sometimes you might even end up with that amount of false positive issues using these tools. That's why, for instance, we security analysts are needed in, in corporations to verify those issues. And then we are falling down uh, to the security assessment. What I hear a lot by people saying, uh, especially not from, uh, from my field, saying, okay, all these security, whatever reports, are falling to penetration test. Because penetration test is just great. Um, yeah, those are great, but pen tests are slightly different than the assessments. Pen tests are basically tools that try to attack. So not scanning the application. Those are also like kind of injecting malicious code, but not directly attacking your application. Pen test, even though it should happen in a, in a predefined environment that is not the production. Sometimes we even execute pen tests on production. Imagine uh, where are plugs? Imagine those <coughs> plugs are not in, in a secure fashion, and you might end up do not leaking those uh, holes. Huh? Stupid or not, but you know kids are also there. Uh, but those should be um, grounded, right? Those are also some sort of uh, penetration test discovered issues. Those are, for instance, not grounded, right? 
or uh, there are UDP ports where you basically can plug blindly your cable should not be allowed to everyone to plug the cable because then you are connecting to a secure uh, network. You should not be even there in that room. But somehow your card allows you to enter that room. Especially in large organizations, from time to time it happens. And then people have to dig into uh, the details, logs, figuring out who gave that permission to that card and why it just happens, which shouldn't. Uh, so those are also pen tests. Um, and there is the so-called security audit, which covers like every single thing. Usually, if it, especially if you are working for a large organization, sometimes you get an audit. Anyone likes audits? I do because that's what I do. Uh, but usually people just don't. Because audits bring you every single thing. That is not correct. Your application doesn't run on the latest version of whatever Drupal 8, for instance. Um, all your cards are not uh, encrypted in the uh, standardized way. Please change it or please raise a word. What we do, uh, analysts, we don't tell you you are a bad person. No, we just give the report. But then you might accept the risk. It's up to you. We might get back in a certain time, like let's say next year, and saying, okay, we see we reported that last year during an audit. You comply now because you started to crown those plans, or your cards are already uh, using secure fashion. Uh, but we might end up saying, you are still not ready to be accepted by our audit uh, standards. Happens what happens. Um, there is one more thing that I would um, mention, which is security review. It's totally different. So when I get there and lead in an audit, that happens because of different assessments and pen testing. Review, though, is slightly easier. What it does, it basically tries to analyze gap between functionalities. Uh, such as like a business analyst does sometimes, but it's from a security perspective. Uh, we try to achieve um, with, with security reviews that you will end up implementing. But all sorts of these reports are basically recommendations. Again, falling back to the same topic, security awareness to raise that. Uh, yeah, and we are ending up in the very last moment uh, when we become a beautiful butterfly. Sometimes companies, especially digital agencies, just don't like to do any maintenance support things, at least in Europe. I don't know how it goes here. Um, but usually these companies are like factories, you know, like, oh, there is a new project, let's develop it, ship it, done, next, done. Um, maintenance is an important point, especially because in about five minutes, the release window will be open. Um, but we have to understand the information security and the three pillars of it. First is the confidentiality. Only and exclusively allow access to data for which the user is allowed to get access. Is permitted. That's confidential. The second pillar is about the integrity how we want to ensure the data is not changed, is not tampered or altered by people who are not authorized to do that, right? Like editing the content. You don't want to end up uh, randomly edited content, right? Um, and the third one is the availability. So when uh, that girl wants to um, access the data, at that moment, she should be aware, of, uh, she should be able to do so. So ensuring systems and data are available to authorize, again, authorized users when they need it, when they try to access it. The whole story starts with the vulnerability management, one of the nicest programs that, that I have ever worked with. 
um, is basically always iteratively identifying different vulnerabilities and learning by them, again, security awareness, and also trying to achieve perfection. We will never, because there will be yet another vulnerability that we have to learn. We fall back again with the no-blaming game, right? Those are bugs. We have to learn out of them. Um, what is important here is basically the, the way how we tackle these issues. So uh, during a, a maintenance phase, we detect the issue, we report it, then we try to remediate. Okay, those are the steps. Sometimes, most of the cases, remediation, so resolving the whole issue, is just not possible. Because it happens out of working hours, because it happens uh, with, with two complex solutions, or we are just not ready to update. What we can do in these moments, we can mitigate the risk. It basically means the risk itself will be lower. That's mitigation. For instance, if there is a, a Drupal um, contrib that requires, um, I don't know, administrator access uh, to, to be exploited, then you might mitigate the risk by only allowing that permission for uh, administrators. I said it wrong. So if the exploit can be done by authenticated users, then you might raise uh, the, or you might uh, revoke the, the permission from authenticated ones and only give it temporary to um, administrators, because then you basically mitigated the risk. So it cannot be that easily executed or exploited. Uh, there are basically two big vendors, uh, which are uh, trusted source uh, nowadays, especially in, in open source. Uh, one is the NVD, the other one, and, and that's what we usually hear, is the CV. Uh, we get uh, identifiers by them, also by the uh, database, the national database, which is quite well known here in the States, if I'm not mistaken. But usually the CV um, issues are uh, the, the first timers uh, that we get. And we have to uh, regularly buy softwares or buy manual uh, workforce uh, monitor them. And also we, we got a great Drupal security team. There is a small story uh, behind the, the codes. Imagine uh, you are trying to understand uh, how an issue can be um, exploited that, that we get on a Wednesday, right? Um, and you get those weird codes. Uh, did you see them, right? Those uh, letters, uh, semicolon, yet another letter, and you just end up with, with a quite long code. That represents the different um, uh, perspectives for <coughs> the issue itself. Uh, there are the first two, which is about access complexity and authentication. What you see here, uh, yeah. what you see here is under the access complexity, there are not only here but all uh, cases. Uh, there are always three different types of uh, values: non, basic, and complex. What it means, access complexity. If it's non, it's super easy to achieve the issue, uh, to, to achieve exploitation. If it's complex, it means the attacker has to follow a certain path, do this, there, are, there might be some other dependencies that, that, that have to happen during the way uh, when he, try, he or she tries uh, to exploit. The authentication is fairly easy. Do I have to be, as an attacker, again, think evil? Do I have to be authenticated on the website or the application or not? If I do have to, do I need higher privileges to exploit or not? That, that's represented by not user and admin. Um, there are the second uh, groups which are about the impact. If you remember the pillars, those um, pillars were said like the confidentiality and integrity. Availability, though, is more on the infrastructure level. So currently, in Drupal security advisories, availability is not tackled directly. But the confidentiality and integrity are. 
as all sum or none uh, levels. If the confidentiality is not impacted, then we end up saying non data will be uh, released. Or integrity uh, can be all, so all data will be, and it's obviously a higher risk, all data will be uh, non integrated uh, by the exploit. As I just mentioned, the availability, though, is currently not in the scope of Drupal vulnerability management. But there are the last two ones which I would definitely highlight as one of the most important ones. Especially the first, this one. If the exploit as a zero day one is already available, which happens zero times in the beginning of Drupal uh, vulnerability management because of disclosure policy and because of a great team that we call Drupal security team. They don't disclose before it happens. But then it might happen there are uh, available proof of concepts by companies that are specialized for it. Or uh, there are already bots that are trying to, uh, in an automated way, exploit sites, which happened uh, back in 2014, if you remember. After a few hours, we got the SQL injection um, vulnerability released. And in a few hours, I don't exactly remember, four or five hours, uh, there were already bots attacking and, and making uh, major dis disruptions on um, application levels. And even going down to, to attacking uh, SQL <coughs> servers. Um, so like, those are obviously ending up with the exploit version. And what is important, and most of the times are just not understood well, what are the target distribution? If it says all, it means all the configurations that are allowed by the given theme or library or project or module um, are just be able to be exploited. So regardless of how I configure that module, it is already uh, in a risk. It is already vulnerable. But there are certain cases when the default value is given what means is how you just get the module from Drupal.org, you basically get the default settings. So like, um, I don't know, Pot Auto comes with different tokens, okay? It builds up your website to use the node, ver uh, node um, uh, string to be as a token for uh, node ID. For instance, I don't exactly know. Uh, if that uh, configuration is vulnerable because of some weird cases, then we most probably will end up saying it's a default case. Because that's a default a shipped uh, configuration that is vulnerable. But there are a few other settings that you might have on your application that are not vulnerable. And in the last case, the uncommon, if you are setting up crazily that um, plugin, then you might end up having uh, the, the vulnerable state of that metric or whatever. Um, those are more or less the things that I wanted to say in, in this uh, session. There is one more uh, slide which I'd like to show you. Uh, which is in Bulgaria exactly, it's kind of like weird, but exactly in 100 days uh, in Sofia, which is uh, the capital of Bulgaria, a super lovely, still quite big city, um, what we are organizing with a few other volunteers, uh, mainly in Europe, yeah, uh, which is called Seco's Days. Um, it turns to secure open source days, so it's not dedicated for Drupal, nor WordPress, not even CMSs. We got talks uh, about uh, DevSecOps topics, security awareness, even um, uh, infrastructure security, uh, how PHP different versions are more secure than the previous ones, things like that. Um, you can check it out on sequelstay.eu. Uh, and uh, I'm just extremely happy to announce uh, Gatsby is one of our uh, goal sponsor 
um, who is basically bringing to, to this country Preston, who is one of the main organizers here, to give a great keynote about security and, and open source. So I'm, I'm really looking forward. And also sessions are uh, uh, still open uh, to be proposed, so I wish everyone to um, spend some time and, and share your knowledge about security uh, with us in certain IT projects and also sponsors, so we are still behind the budget, uh, please. And if you have any questions, now it's your turn, please. <coughs> okay, go ahead. Part of the <coughs> problem I've seen uh, different organizations, especially people who are technically minded, well, with me too, <laughs> no, we're gonna get the same, uh, is what passes, there's two things, it's can you mem remember it? Okay. And, you know, is it secure? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big fan of XKCD where he goes through, I'm sure people see it, like the phrasal mm -hmm. uh, passwords and how they're actually more secure than you know, the number of substitutions and, and yeah. the characters. But most places I you know, use passwords on don't allow phrases. You know, mm -hmm. they don't allow, like, you have to put in a number, you have to put in a special character. Sure. I mean, not allowed to use spaces, whatever. What do you see is, do you see like a trend towards allowing people to use more memorable, but more secure phrases, or is it always going to be like unmemorable, less secure phrases, or less secure passwords? Okay. Uh, so for the record, uh, basically the question is about uh, what do we see from the market? Uh, how we allow or, or bigger organizations allow memorable uh, passwords versus uh, random ones or more complex ones, right? That's more. Actually, like less complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would say definitely uh, use tools that mem that remembers your password instead of you. Uh, there are great uh, commercial ones. There are even open source ones. I don't really have the names because that market is, is out of my interest uh, but, uh, and my professions. Um, but basically there are tools that, bas that just remembers instead of you have to uh, for the for the password, <coughs> which is also important to not use the same password uh, in different services. So if you have a Gmail, uh, use one password. If you have a Facebook, use another one. If you have a Yahoo Mail or whatever, or Ford, Fifth, 10 million different uh, services, do not use the same. Not even like a little bit changed password. Because Besides if yourself, one you know, of if anybody else does that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's a problem. Like, it is a problem. And I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, we're always looking for ways to, like, actually address, yeah, everybody should use these random strings, but no one remembers those. A lot of people don't use these to. applications. I mean, we are in the 21st century. There are tools that can remember instead of you have to. Yeah. Right? Uh, so those are uh, secret management. Also, um, you know, there is a topic uh, how DevOps, for instance, or sysadmins uh, manage root access either by keys, but keys are basically, again, just quite long and randomized, let's say, strings, um, but they don't remember all the passwords. Right. Sometimes even with a key plus a password, they do. Uh, and the password just have to be as complex as possible, but no one remembers. I mean, you don't end up uh, managing 10,000 servers uh, and, and knowing, okay, that one has this password, that's secret management. I, I would definitely uh, suggest to uh, Google it first and, and then uh, I can also help you a little bit after the session or during the conference. Uh, to I, I, I have, you know, like I have mm -hmm. Chrome remember most of my passwords yeah. here, which is, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's particularly secure, but I just wonder like generally, you know, as a, as a corporate, um, you know, what you're suggesting to users within a corporation is like there's a, is there a good standard to go by? Yeah, um, changing it regularly, uh, not allowing um, the same password to be set after a certain amount of uh, certain amount of times. Um, also, not allowing phrases that that's important. Um, such as the username to be used in the password, even backward, things like that. Um, Complexity-wise, using uh, capital letters, uh, special characters, numbers, uh, and requiring at least 10, 12 characters, possibly. 
uh, those are kind kind of industrial center uh, for for desktops. But if you go further for servers or for locks or whatever, there are yet another different secret management practices. That that's what I would say now. Okay. Uh, I saw one more hand, even though we are kind of running out of time. Okay, uh, then I'm just showing you the thank you slide and thank you.